Welcome everybody. Hello, beautiful people. Thank you so much for joining us here today. I wanna to start out by offering a land acknowledgement. And today I'm gonna to actually give the land acknowledgement we usually give to elementary school children, but I feel this one is very powerful and we can always learn as if we were children. We acknowledge that the land we are gathered today is the traditional land of the Ramitush Ohlone people, who must give, we must give thanks and respect to the Ohlone people by taking care of the earth and the animals and one another. We acknowledge that non Ohlone residents are guests on this occupied land, and we are grateful for the opportunity to live, learn, and play here. As uninvited guests, we should promise to uplift and respect the Ohlone people and their history and their work. I also wanna thank our behind the scenes staff here at the library who really make this place run, our media services crew, our security crew, and our custodial crew, and all the unseen labor that doesn't get the credit they deserve. So yay them, and thank you everybody for being here. So this is part of our Viva Latinx Heritage Month celebration, but we are um, dedicated to programming, all sorts of diverse programming all year round. So while we are celebrating Latinx Heritage Month, you can find this type of programming all year round. Backtable has lots of information about upcoming events, and you can always check us out online. So today we are here for the film, The Keepers of the Corn which tells the story of indigenous farmers, artisans, and cooks as they share the origins of native corn and how their ancestors have protected these seeds for over 350 generations. And I would like to bring up now the filmmaker, Gustavo Vasquez Orozoco. Um, he is an independent filmmaker with over 30 productions, including documentaries, videos, video installations, experimental films. He has won international awards such as the Rockefeller Grant, the Eureka Grant for Visual Arts. His work explores intercultural studies, identity, and the U.S.-Mexican border. Notable films include Que Viva La Lucha and contributions to Vision's Latino art and culture. And that is available here at the library on our streaming service. Um, his work has been exhibited at the Smithsonian the de Young Museum, and the St. Louis Science Center. He is currently a professor at UC Santa Cruz in the cinema and digital media department. Gustavo, please join us. Would you like to set up the film for us? And welcome. After the film, we will have a q and A. It It'll be a short discussion and a Q&A, so please stick around. Come on up. You're welcome, Gustavo. Buenas tardes, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming here. I hope you uh, get to enjoy this work. It's been a, a, a beautiful, extraordinary journey to be close to the land, to be close to the indigenous farm workers that have kept this tradition in, in using their indigenous science that has been applied and been passed on in a very elaborate process in the laboratory that we call it our land, our planet. But in a more sensitive um, way, understanding the different layers of the land, our, our mother, the spirituality that is connected to every action that we take uh, and honor her, and this the documentary is a, a beautiful effort that was started with my friends in Oaxaca that are my co-producers, Gira and Jonathan Barbieri. And everything started with, I'm a visual artist. So they sent me photographs of the corn in the Feria de la Biodiversidad in Oaxaca. And I was impressed, was totally amazed by the quantity of corn when it's native, it has that original, each uh, ear is different, even from the same plant. And I grew up in Tijuana, so that drew us into creating this project. 
to tell the story, but the, our process is collective, a collective effort. So we spent three years working with different communities. It's a participatory process where we unite ourselves and align, align ourselves with the community's voices. So it's really, you know, they, sometimes you read the director, well, it's really a collective effort. It's a community effort to make this film. And I hope you get to enjoy it. Uh, there's a lot of layers to it, a lot of information. And uh, at the end, please stay so we can have our presentation and our conversation. So thank you again for being here. It's an honor to be in my, my community. I'm the adopted you know, immigrant from Mexico, and I've been in this beautiful city with this community for uh, like 50 years now. So bienvenidos, gracias, and please enjoy. Wasn't that beautiful? Thank you so much for bringing that to us. I'd like to now bring on our stage, um, Gustavo, please come back. And then we have our two producers all the way from Oaxaca. Is that amazing? Thank you so much for being here today. So today we have, of course, Gustavo. And then we have Jonathan Barberia. And, um, whoops, passed up, uh, Aire Vallejo. And our guest joining us today from here, Daniela Tabora. I'm just gonna give some brief um, intros on all of our folks today. Um, I've already introduced Gustavo. Yaira spent 10 years in the wine and spirits industry in New York City before returning to Mexico in 2014 to work with smallholder farming families producing native corn. In 2017, she joined the organizing committee of the Agro Biodiversity Fair, which gathers over 400 farmers from across communities in Oaxaca to exchange native seeds, along with her husband, Jonathan. Um, Jonathan is a fine arts painter, originally from DC, and has lived in Oaxaca for over 35 years, with 27 of those spent in small towns and villages. His artwork is featured in collections across the US, Europe, and Mexico. And Daniela Tabora, um, from here, is uh, her journey of reconnecting with the land began through herbalism, driven by her desire to prove, to preserve the intergenerational wisdom of plant medicine and her lineage. She is passionate about expanding access to knowledge, space, and opportunity for her community. She believes believing black and brown communities should lead in accessing these essential resources. Please come on the stage, everybody. Welcome so much. Our moderator today will be Jonathan. Gustavo, Yera, Daniela, Jonathan. Muy bien, buenas noches, o buenas tardes todavía. <laughs> Good afternoon, I hope uh, everybody enjoyed the film, and I hope that the film has, or will, through this discussion, uh, provoke more questions than it does answers, because I think that the way forward is to always question what we're doing today. And I'm just going to give you a little rundown about some of the history behind this before we start going into talking about uh, uh, the Feria de la Agrobiodiversidad, which Yira will cover, and um, the way we came about making this film, which Gustavo will cover, and Daniela will cover some of the um, more current, uh, more urban um, challenges that we have, uh, that we see today. Um, We'll get into that in a little while. First of all, uh, I think it's really important <clears throat> that we understand that corn, this native corn that we were featuring today in the film, is not a relic. It's not something 
uh, to be taken out for Halloween or Thanksgiving once a year. It's in fact the most modern corn on the planet because since its invention by native scientists 6,500 years ago, the descendants of those original native scientists have been curating corn and shepherding it throughout 350 generations into the 21st century by way of a selection process that takes place at the end of every harvest. And they're not selecting necessarily for how pretty the corn is or the colors or whatever. They're selecting, as um, Don Floriano mentioned in the, in the film, they're selecting for characteristics that will help the corn confront climate change and climate changes that have been going on in the past 6,000 years and the current climate crisis so that as the floods get deeper, as the winds get stronger, as the droughts get longer, the corn is being slowly adapted to confront these. Now, GMO corn or Monsanto corn is actually locked in the 1980s. It's frozen in the 1980s, which is why it requires so many chemicals in order to just survive out in the, in the campo. And when we think about the campo, we're always thinking about ecology, we're thinking about biodiversity, we're thinking about coevolution with people, and we're thinking about communities, and we're thinking about culture. That's what the campo was all about. That's what makes native corn now, even though it's been so for many, many generations, now it has become a kind of a banner for resistance against what has become the corporate commodified food chain. And native corn represents to us, and it will represent to a lot of people very soon, food autonomy and seed sovereignty, which is to say that campesinos and farmers have the right to preserve their seeds and choose their seeds and do not have to buy seeds every year from the big corporations. <clears throat> and fundamental to this is the breaking of what I consider to be called, or I would call, the supermarket food chain. So this is where we're going as, uh, uh, como se llama este Chap uh, Chapella? Uh, said one of the, Sorry. from Ignacio Chapella from uh, UC Berkeley said, uh, this is the future of agriculture. It's not the past, it's not a relic. This is the future. And anyway, for us it was a beautiful experience because um, as we decided to start down the road or down the rabbit hole of this documentary, we began the documentary without uh, a script. We let the documentary unfold as we went. And we were very fortunate to be uh, invited into the homes of so many wonderful people in the different, different uh, regions of Oaxaca and um, to let the script write itself. And that's what happened. So we started out thinking this is a very interesting subject and we ended up knowing a whole lot about it and we're still learning about it. And I'll hand the microphone over to Jira uh, well, maybe first Gustavo to tell us about how the film came about and what we learned. Um, gracias. This um, process is a journey where the more we listen and so what the, the concepts of biodiversity in the West sometimes is looked at nature separate from humans. But we are part of that biodiversity, linguistically, traditions, cultures, even making tortillas. If you notice, in different regions, the women make tortillas in a different way. They're different sizes. Even within the state of Oaxaca, there's a whole universe of knowledge even in, in the languages that are more, indigenous languages that are more poetic, there's a lot of coding in the depth of its meaning that oftentimes is not perceived 
by Western cosmologies. So the, there's a universe within a universe of knowledge that is being passed on. And by only by listening carefully in filming and following, one person will lead us to the next person in the next person, in the next community. But when there's some things that are spoken like by um, Pedro, when he says, we doing El Teque, working together, we learn about who we are, which means collectively. So we're dealing with uh, or entering the universe of community real community where is the community is more rich in, in, in wealthy in knowledge than the, than the individual. So we see these asymmetrical systems of knowledge and bodies of knowledge that oftentimes are not perceived. It seems that a campesino is simple, but it's not. They have so much knowledge, and they are aware of what's going on on this planet. They're very well informed. So there's a lot of misconceptions about, you know, university. I teach at a university, and I work with the students and academics. But when I was there, I can recognize those bodies of knowledge, and only by truly being doing deep listening do I sense and gather more and more, and that's pretty much how define and, and give us the structure for a glimpse of a whole universe that it will take a series of documentaries for us to really unfold uh, or unpack all of that uh, information, right? I mean, we're talking, we're trying to cover in this, uh, the, the problems, the contemporary realities, of um, malnutrition, of corporations, scientists that are sometimes at, you know we're at risk and the communities are at risk of biopiracy. There's a lot of things that are, we just kind of touch a few points of them, but it will truly require a much, much more work. And at least we're contributing, we're hoping to contribute to this conversation. Um, so I could go on about the learning and hopefully we're learning together because even though I will do research and read about it, only by being there on ground zero is really a true learning experience and inspiration to follow. And hopefully some of these messages are being transmitted where uh, us as consumers in the cities reevaluate what farmers do and what they know. Uh, I, I, before I turn the microphone over to Gira, I just want to make a little bit of a, uh, put some emphasis on the word community that uh, uh, Gustavo mentioned and the ownership of seeds. You see, being that the people today, whether it be in the Chinantla or in the Mixteca or wherever we filmed, um, are the descendants of the people who invented corn in the first place, they're really uh, the curators of that intellectual property. And the idea that privatization can come, or private companies can come along and steal that uh, a genome from that corn and use it as part of their database to then patent and sell back to people, this is a big deal. This is going to be a big, problem in the future. It's a geopolitical problem right now. Right now between Mexico and the United States and Canada because under the free trade initiative the United States and Canada are insisting that Mexico adapt and adopt its, uh, adapt its diet, its sovereign diet to GMO corn and the support chemicals that are needed in order for that GMO to uh, survive. And one of the worst of those chemicals, aside from all of the um, nitrogen and everything else and, and the destruction of soil, is glyphosate or Roundup, which was shown in the film, which is uh, an herbicide, which is designed to basically kill the competition, meaning that any plant that doesn't have, that has not been genetically modified, 
to, to um, withstand this herbicide will be wiped out. But the problem is that it doesn't stop there. Then it trickles down into the runoff, and then it trickles down into the streams and rivers. And finally, a good example is uh, the 100-mile dead zone at the mouth of the, the Mississippi River, which is dead because glyphosate continues to kill plankton out in the ocean. And so when we're talking about biodiversity and when we're talking about um, uh, native corn as, as the corn of the future, and when we're talking about the intellectual property belonging to communities, and, and then we're talking about seed sovereignty, then you can see how important these issues are. And Yerda is deeply involved in the Feria de la Agrobiodiversidad. And this is an organization that um, came about about 10 years ago. She'll explain it a little bit further, but it comes out of a long thousand year old tradition of seed exchanges between different villages. Because a seed exchange is not just an exchange of a package of genetic material, it's an exchange of experience and knowledge. And so I'll let Yura tell you about that. Hola a todos. So as you, as you saw, La Feria de Agrobiodiversidad is an, uh, an event that happens every year in Oaxaca. But these, um, these events, like Jonathan mentioned, have happened in the past for hundreds or maybe thousands of years. But this special event in Oaxaca, that it, this year's, it turns 13 years, I believe, it's an effort from different organizations that are supporting uh, communities and also local cabildos. So it gathers about 400 farmers or campesinos that come together with their family just after uh, harvest to exchange not only seeds, but also knowledge. And this is amazing because if you go there, you want to spend a lot of time and to learn about what they know. Because everything that they bring is coming from La Milpa. So it's not only native corn. You saw squash, uh, different types of beans, different types of quelites that grows in La Milpa. And uh, first of all, the event, it's for, for the farmers only, for the campesinos. So they can exchange seeds, you know, also to, to tell each other what happened last year, uh, if the seeds they, they exchanged last year, they, if, if it worked in their fields, and uh, then the doors are open to the public. And every year, it's more people coming. I remember the first time that we went, it was almost empty, just the farmers. Now it's like, I don't know, 4,000 people coming. It's crazy. Sandra, a friend, has been there. And it's beautiful because you also want to go there and not only to learn, but to buy, you know, a little bit of these seeds and to have amazing frijoles or things. I remember one time that there was this kind of uh, bean that it was so tiny that they call it frijol arroz. You know, like, and I haven't seen that in a long time. So one of the farmers, he was able to sell me one kilo, but I forgot to clean it, <laughs> and it was full of stones. <laughs> so well, anyway. So it's a, a beautiful event. Every time we have a lot of challenges for La Feria, you know, because uh, at the beginning it was supported mainly by Conavio, that is a national uh, uh, biodiversity uh, council. But uh, unfortunately, the government has been cutting funds for Conavio, so there's not enough money. But the good part is that a lot of the restaurants have come together and they usually support La Feria. So I'm always asking for money every year to the, to the uh, farmers, to the chefs, to the restaurants, and they know, you know that it's coming, so they support La Feria. So now we're just beginning to to start with the organization, if you ever go to Oaxaca, it, it doesn't have an exact date, but it happens uh, at the end of November or the first Saturday of December. And uh, every year we try to invite as much producers as we can, but also the producers can come by themselves. And it's a free event, and most of all, uh, to see and to learn from uh, campesinos. The, the, the amount of knowledge that they know 
it's uh, unbelievable, you know. So I welcome you to go to La Feria if you ever go to Oaxaca. And, and the film is really served nicely also in that um, universities here in this country have been uh, purchasing the film for their libraries. And generally speaking, it's a small sum. It's something like $400. And uh, that money, all of that money, goes directly to the Ferdia. So that's our tr contribution. It's that the film is kind of walking through the different university libraries of, of this country and um, picking up funds for the Feria. By the way, I, I think we may have skipped over this, but um, the film has, uh, I think it's been in about uh, over 20 film festivals, and it's been in over a dozen countries, and it's been translated to um, obviously English and, and Spanish, but also Turkish and Italian, and it's, I think, currently being translated to French. And um, it just keeps going on and on. And clearly there are many, many other themes that are popping up in the, in the time, in the couple of years since we uh, made the film. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a huge, unwieldy subject. It's, we barely were able to scratch the surface of some of these, these issues. And um, I'm gonna turn the microphone now over to Daniela to tell us what, people are doing in Richmond, California, across the bay right now with regard to native corn. Thank you, Jonathan. Hello, everyone. Um, so as Jonathan mentioned, I'm here as a representative of Urban Tilth. Uh, for folks that don't know, Urban Tilth is a nonprofit organization um, in Richmond. And yeah, uh, we have... Um, a diverse set of programs, but our main goal is to get fresh produce out to our Richmond residents. Um, Richmond is known as a food desert uh, where we don't have a Sprouts or a Trader Joe's or a Safeway within the, uh, the vicinity of Richmond. Um, it's mostly small stores, small mercados that really uphold um, getting yeah produce out to the community of Richmond but um, yeah folks that want to go out and get fresh produce have to go outside of out of the city to to get that so urban tilth um, hosts various free farm stands that are set up all throughout the city of Richmond we also have a community supported agriculture program a CSA program um, inclusively within that program, we have a Veggie RX where folks can get their fresh produce bags paid through their insurance. Um, and I currently work at the North Richmond Farm site as a farmer and educator. And we have a program that is hosted for six months out of the year, training other young adults in learning how to cultivate the land. And we were just talking earlier about how this kind of work isn't just about cultivating the land, but for a lot of the newer generation, recognizing that it's a healing and a remembrance of sorts where people are able to decide what their relationship with the land looks like, decide what their relationship with fresh produce looks like, um, and having fresh produce that is nutrient dense, um, understanding that the soil is its own microbiome and its own world and taking care of that as well as we're taking care of ourselves, as we're taking care of the community. Um, inclusively at the Richmond Public Library, we have a seed library where residents can go in and also very much like La Feria exchange seeds. Um, and if you, you know, grab a couple seeds, the contingency is that you come back and donate some seeds. Uh, we also have, do some work with um, the East Bay Seed Savers program as well. And a lot of it is, yeah, wanting to share stories, share knowledge, um, share land-raised seeds um, and produce that does well in our climate. Um, in comparison to San Francisco, Richmond is a little bit warmer, <laughs> but we do get a lot of winds as well. So that's also something that when we're discussing seed saving, we're also looking at characteristics of these plants that are resilient um, in our own unique climate um, and something that 
was said to me earlier this year that has really stuck with me is that resiliency isn't about being um, rigid. It's about flexibility. Um, and yeah, about flexibility and that resistance is about flexibility and being able to be adaptable to different environments and uh, much like how we as people are adaptable, so are the plants. And it is an act of deep listening and deep uh, understanding when you're working with the land, getting your hands in the soil. Uh, we have all these kinds of new terms for how we understand biodiversity and biointensive farming and all these things. Um, but for people that have come from generations of working the land, it's it just is the way <laughs> of tending to the land, of working with it, of preserving those stories. It's just the way that things are grown. It's not just corn. It's like the three sisters. It's your calabacitas. It's the beans. Um, it's um, amaranth. It's sunflowers. It's tobacco um, and all those beautiful things and, and very much... Uh, understanding that that's how things also grow in nature in a forest is that there's these tiered canopies. It's the trees, it's the vines, it's the shrubs, it's the mycelial network in the soil. Um, and yeah, I'm just really honored to be here to shed light to the ways that we can do this work um, across states, across nations, across cities and towns. Um, it starts here. It starts in our own backyards. It starts in our community farms. Um, it starts with our neighbors, with our families, with our friends, exchanging stories, preserving that knowledge, sharing it, not being um, stingy with it. And, um, and yeah, just like working with our communities directly here. And so Urban Tilth is uh, such a great example of that where a lot of the work that we're doing is uh, forward facing, is community facing, is very much directed at the residents of Richmond and an understanding that um, our black and brown communities are at the forefront of these socioeconomic uh, food disparities and having access to these things. But uh, if you're close to the problem, you're also very close to the solution as well. So. Uh I was saving that for the question and answer period <laughs> because inevitably after seeing the film and talking about the film on these panels, somebody from the audience inevitably says, so what can we do? Well, now you know. <laughs> now you know what you can do. Um, it's probably a good idea to um, open the, the forum up to questions and answers. I see somebody raising their hand back there. Come on, come on, come on. Please definitely wait for me to get to you with the mic. Muy buenas tardes, uno, dos, tres, probando. Eh, gracias por estar aquí, doy las gracias por ese, ese hemorragia de información que se me ha brindado y este público tan bonito que ha tomado su tiempo para honrarles a ustedes con el trabajo increíble que han hecho. Un um, par de preguntitas, la primera es, Quizás no lo cogí mucho en la película, pero los bancos de acumulación de semillas para en caso de las emergencias que mencionó el señor, ¿eso es a nivel bastante global o es algo como estaba mencionando ella que por miles de años se ha seguido eh, conservando y preservando semillas para aquel momento que haya una emergencia? Y la segunda es que como dijo el hombre que dijo, bueno, de que vamos a vivir. Quizá la gente que no siembra se muere primero, pero yo también me voy a morir. Así que, ¿cómo ustedes ven ese proceso? Muy bien. Creo que debo de traducir la pregunta también, ¿no? Este, so, I'll translate that and we'll try to do this in a, in a bilingual manner. Um, the question primarily was whether or not uh, these seed banks are um, global or are happening across the planet, uh, which is the first question, eh, de que si o no son globales eh, esos bancos de semilla. Principalmente, eh, para contestar eso, eh, son muy localizados, son de comunidades. Y la razón en nuestro caso, y hablo en ese caso sobre la situación en Oaxaca, México, la razón es porque 
hay, hay un, una topografía tan convolucionada eh, entre vallecitos y bolsitas ecológicas, este, montañas y picos y, y, y planos cost, de costeras y todo eso, de que las semillas son muy específicas a cada zona. ¿sí? Eh, hay una diversidad de, de, en el caso de, de maíz, de, que dicen de que hay 65 uh, diferentes variedades de maíz en México y 35 uh, variedades en Oaxaca, pero el Instituto uh, Nacional de Lenguas coloca 171 lenguas en Oaxaca. Y eso es se debe a que están aisladas diferentes comunidades y empieza a desarrollar un dialecto dentro de lo que es, por ejemplo, el lenguaje el zapoteco, en que hay como 40 diferentes dialectos, ¿no? y, y pronto, pronto hablando de durante miles de años, una parte no puede entender a la otra. Pero lo mismo está pasando con el maíz. El maíz está... Eh, coevolucionando, como dijo en la película, con este, pH de suelo muy específicas, con clima muy específico, con este, alturas arriba del nivel del mar muy específicos y que un maíz no necesariamente de este lugar va a resultar bien acá. Entonces, cada comunidad tiene su banco de semilla o idónicamente debe, debería de tener su banco de semilla para poder responder en caso de una emergencia. Ahora, en inglés. Pero, pero antes, okay. antes, cada familia tiene su banco de semillas. Sí. Cada familia. Sí. O sea, empezando por cada familia. Después, obviamente, las comunidades que están tratando de tener bancos de semillas comunitarios. Pero cada familia tiene su banco de semillas. No todas las comunidades tienen banco de semillas. Eso sí es importante. ¿no? So, pero cada familia la tiene. So, Yura says that um, every family has its own seed bank. And every community, what I was saying is, um, needs to have their own community seed bank because of the seeds are very, or the grain or the type of seed is very specific to the landscape. And there is a lot of diversity. We've talked about a lot of diversity to t today. Um, and there is something like 65 different official varieties of corn in Mexico, and 35 of those occur in uh, Oaxaca. But the National Institute of Languages, or tongues as they say, um, places Oaxaca with 171 different t spoken tongues. And that's because of the isolation, isolation that is uh, caused by this incredibly convoluted topography in Oaxaca that creates these different ecosystems in little tiny pockets all over the, the state from in different altitudes. So the thing is that um, everybody needs to have a very specific seed bank, although there is a centralized seed bank, which is the INIFAB, um, which tries to be able to respond to disasters in any community, right? So anybody else? I was wondering, is there any way where we could, here as a community, able to support them by buying maybe some of the corn or the tortillas? Are they selling that to local markets or anything like that? I mean. It's, yes, well, in, it's, there's not enough. <laughs> you know, whatever they, right now we have a lot of challenges with uh, uh, the environment. So usually every year, it depends if it rains or not, they're gonna have the harvest. And most of these farmers, they uh, plant for their own consumption. And then if they have extra, then they will sell it. But then the restaurants or uh, in local markets, it's gone. <laughs> so <laughs> and yet, yes, there's, there are some companies that now bring uh, native corn to the US which is also a challenge in Mexico, no? Yeah, I, I could add to that by saying um, there are a couple of um, companies that import corn from Oaxaca, Michoacán, and El Estado de Mexico. And for, they sell to restaurants here in um, principally 
I would say in California and New York. Um, um, and the problem with that is that there are two problems with that. One of them is that there were a whole lot of Native Americans in this country growing corn that one might turn to. And secondly, um, a lot of farmers in, will take, say, a, a, a grain of corn, like, say, from someplace, La Chinatla in Oaxaca, and try to grow it in, say, upstate New York and still be calling it Oaxacan or Chinanteco or uh, native corn. And for us, it's a, it, there's a, a conceptual challenge here, and that is that if you take the native people whose intellectual property this is out of the cycle, then you can't really call it native corn. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't grow it and use it, and it will, it will adapt very quickly within one generation. It will begin to evolve to um, be able to survive in that soil, say in upstate New York or wherever it is. Um, but then it's a different corn. It's no longer native corn, right? And I think that right now the commercialization of this very, very specific corn um, to restaurants, let's say, in the United States, although it does bring certain economic benefits to a few people, it breaks down the notion of you know, the community, intellectual property, and the people who invented it in the first place. So it's a very complex issue. I'd like to add to that too. The, the thing about corn is that it's both a seed and a grain. So to use it as a grain is fine to consume it, but if we use it as a seed, maybe at a family, small, growing some of that corn would be fine. But I think the risk is the, the appropriation of seeds that have been shepherd for thousands of years in one community. And if I work in Silicon Valley, have make a lot of money and I feel like, you know what, I can grow that by some land and grow some of that corn. Well, there's, it's hard to set any type of laws to protect that, but it's truly immoral to do that kind of action. So I think that's the risk about the generosity of these indigenous communities that believe in sharing, but we have a history of colonialism that doesn't believe in sharing, and that is the delicate problem. But also, some, some important thing is to to understand that maybe what you can do is locally. You know, what can I do locally? You know, where are the, the campesinos here, the farmers? How can I support them? How can I um, help and share, you know, the, whatever they're doing? Like, for instance, Urban Tilt, that I think it's a great example. So we were discussing that in, we had a, also, a projection in Oaxaca with different uh, with Sandra and different uh, academics, and I think the most important thing is locally, what can I do? Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, I think that's the answer. Uh, and I, I think that just as we have localized seed banks, we should have localized economies. Uh, you have a question? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I was looking over. <laughs> You'll be next. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, yeah, um, well, thank you so much for sharing the film. Um, I, I wanted to ask actually about um, communication and, and art. I'm, I'm an artist. I focus a lot on food and food systems. And something I think I struggle with is that sometimes, like even maybe today, you know, people come in are already interested. And, you know, people um, go to seek out, like, the best restaurant that has the best local ingredients. But... There's a lot of people maybe who aren't paying attention or maybe they say, I don't care, or they want to just buy the cheapest corn. And, you know, I feel like, you know, it's so hard sometimes to get people to care and people aren't, they're not listening and they're not paying attention. And it feels so hard to think about what are the ways to kind of bring people in. So I'm curious really for everybody, but maybe um, Gustavo, if you want to start, you know, just like, what do you think is the way to really like spread the message, but also so that people care, so that they say, oh, okay, now like I, I'm activated um, because I feel like that's such a challenge now. And people are also watching things constantly. You know, they're always watching. There's so many documentaries, 
but what will it take to say to get people to say okay like i'm going to behave differently or i'm going to make a decision differently okay well uh, as an artist and filmmaker and i made this film in in, in a collective effort with communities uh, this is our contribution to a conversation uh, i don't know if this will solve those problems but i will then turn the same question to the public that is here for someone to respond to your experience seeing the film and what we're trying to communicate and your reception of it. Because I think that's, you know, we make it, send it out, hoping that we'll have a function of it, at least inspire possible changes, but only the individuals that are looking at it will make that decision, right? So maybe one or Somebody can respond to that? I, I, actually, I think Daniela oh, would Daniela, like to please. add something to that. Thank you. No, no, no. no. Um, Daniela, please. Well, I would say um, one of the easiest ways to get people to care is have them try a tomato or something from the supermarket and then have them try something organic <laughs> that they've maybe picked off fresh from the vine. Um, and there's, there's farms here in San Francisco. There's the Alemany farm. There's Hummingbird farm. I'm also sure that there is a seed bank here in, in San Francisco. And if not, then that's something to look into starting here locally. Um, but if you've ever had, yeah, just anything that is organic, um, if, if you've had the, the pleasure and the privilege, right, because we're also talking about access, um, it's one of the easiest ways to get people to care because you, you try something from the supermarket. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just say like a tomato, for example, right? that we use every day. Um, you, you get it from the supermarket and it's kind of pale. It doesn't have much flavor. It's big, um, but then you go and you have something organic either from the farmer's market or if you're lucky, right? Like to be able to have it, to harvest it yourself and it's robust and it's juicy and it's red and it's flavorful and you don't need to add much to it um, for it to have like this impact as soon as you try it. And then that's where people begin to percolate on the idea of, well, why, why can't all the meals that I have taste like this? Um, why can't all the tomatoes taste like this or, or the, the corn that I'm eating? Why, why isn't it this delicious and nutrient dense and um, and it almost like rev revolutionizes people where it's not just about growing your own it's also about saving those seeds it's also about getting other people to care and then if and then if you know later on the line like you're someone who has kids right then it's like I want my kids to be able to have access to fresh produce I want my kids to be able to have access to knowing, what it is, what it's like to grow your own or to have seeds that were passed down for many generations. <laughs> we got a couple other people first. <laughs> so we're, so we're these guys. <laughs> uh, first of all, let me appreciate the hard work of investigation and research that you presented in this documentary. It's not only for all of you, but also the you know the guys on the back, and then also I, the beautiful headline that is going to connect it. What I believe is our responsibility as well is who are the guardians of quiénes son los guardianes del maíz? Not only them, but every single one of us. Very humbly, I'm an uh, educator, and I work with small kids with the special ed, mm -hmm. but. On Monday is going to be a, one of my topics to them, because it's me passing this with them, and if we every single of us take a little responsibility of being the, los guardianes del maíz. I'm my wife and I from Oaxaca, and we've been seeing this from firsthand from our own families. So this is my responsibility as an educator, and also as a producers what's the next film? Because the Oaxaqueños are not only in Oaxaca, mm. we are here everywhere. And unfortunately, others are working in the farms as well. And the same conditions in terms of no pure maize, we eating those tortillas 
that are not healthy anymore, even in, in the United States. Thank you. So we're gonna go here and we're gonna go here. <laughs> so I, I had an observation um, and I have thoroughly enjoyed the film. My work is in rescuing indigenous epistemologies and pedagogies and using them in the classroom at the college and university level. So I was very interested in how um, the knowledge is presented. And one of the observations that I find, I, I actually don't think, and I'm gonna be a little, I actually don't think that the folks in Oaxaca need our help per se. I believe that they're doing what they need to do, that we're the ones that need help. And Daniela, I, I really want to, I wanna know more about the healing and remembrance to reestablish our relationship with the land. Because as a fully colonized people living in the belly of the empire, we have been so disconnected to our knowledge, our local indigenous knowledges um, of the land and our relationship to it. And so trying to rescue that, I really want, I just want to say thank you for the work that you're doing in Richmond, and I'd like to talk about bringing it to Vallejo. Um, so that, that's, I, I want to commend that that's the piece. It's not explicit in the film, but it's certainly implicit in that the Oaxacans are doing just fine. It's us who need the help in reestablishing our connection to the land. We live in cement jungles, in food deserts. So I just want to commend you for that. And I am very interested in bringing this film to San Francisco State and to Napa Valley College. Thank you. Puedo, puedo, puedo comentar algo brevemente. Muy, muy breve. Is, uh, I, I would like to just make a brief comment with re that regard. Um, and I fully agree with you. The Oaxacan, the Oaxacans and the, and the people in Michoacana, the people in the Estado de Mexico uh, that are out in the campo and growing their food, they don't need help from here unless in the sense that the United States stops pressuring Mexico to uh, accept its glyphosate, you know? um, but um, and the other thing that you mentioned is turn to your neighbor, turn to the indigenous people here. For example, turn to small farmers, small holding farmers here, right? Um, I, I think you brought up some really, really important matters there. Um, it, many times that we've pr presented the film here in the in this country, people always want to do what can we do to help? As if everybody on the on the on the screen there is poor, and they're not. They're not poor because the definition of poverty is really uh, variable, you know, and it's really relative to well, who's looking at it and, and what are you poor in, you know? And please. Okay. Hi. Um. So I've been recently learning about regenerative agriculture and like from my understanding, it doesn't have a set definition, but it's revolved around soil health, but it's basically just a lot of indigenous practices, if not all indigenous practices. Um, and I've noticed that a lot of large companies like General Mills are investing their money into farmers that are growing regeneratively. And I was just wondering like, What's your opinions on that, or like, what are your thoughts on that? It's quite the loaded question. I think that whenever we have any kind of large corporations behind um, industrial farming, whether they're investing their money even in regenerative agriculture and all these things, that they, it's still in one way or another, um, missing the mark or um, not or, quite there. Or a wolf in sheep's clothing. Yeah, a wolf in sheep's clothing, exactly. And um, yeah, it's, it's always going to be backwards in some way, especially um, even just thinking about, yeah, it is a lot of indigenous uh, agricultural practices and there is no honoring of that um, and even if there is some semblance of honoring that um, it's still not 
um, paying tribute in, in ways that are like embodied. Um, and recently actually for, for the program that I'm leading, we had a doctor come and do like a workshop on soil health and soil testing and things like that. And he's doing a whole research project where he's finding that, um, urban farms are the ones who have the most alive and healthy soil and in many ways are remediating the soil um, given that they are in these urban um, settings, they surprisingly have less uh, trace chemicals and things like that in their soil. And so there is a lot to to urban farming and to these agricultural practices. And um, a lot of it, yeah, is is tied to like just an indigenous stewardship and 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 being able to embody that goes beyond just words beyond just like an acknowledgement of um yeah you know uh, it, this is a little bit off the subject but it's really parallel and that is that um i was recently reading about shaker uh furniture and shaker aesthetic and shaker design and shaker craftsmanship and through my reading you know i was on, on the on google or whatever um i got diverted to um that you can buy imitation shaker furniture in places like Target. And I was blown away. It's like, wait a minute, that's commodifying artisan artisanship, mm -hmm. commodifying artisanship. It's like, if there is anything uh, oxymoronic uh, that, uh, you know, about that, that there it is. It's like, how can this happen? You know, and many times in Oaxaca, we um, have been approached by people that are saving the countryside and raising up 1,400 women from poverty in the countryside. And you scroll down, you scroll down, and you scroll down, and it's Bimbo, and it's Bercel, and it's Coca-Cola, and all of these people that are now trying to masquerade as, and they're always saving somebody, you know, uh, which is interesting. <laughs> Um, and, and I think that uh, part of, and to, to answer your question over there, again, um, how do you get people to care? I think that you start the conversation. You do a film, you um, set up a little, I don't know, maybe a lemonade stand out there on the street with organic lemonade, lemons, you know, or something like that. I don't know. But everybody can be creative in their own way. And, start this conversation and get people going on it because we do have to we do have to save the planet i mean it's not going to save itself at this point you know and 40 percent of the world's arable land is destroyed is destroyed in the sense that the soil has the nutritional value of styrofoam so it's a big deal you know this is the future so next question final question Mil gracias por <coughs> su gran obra fascinante y con tantas lenguas que oí, no hay nada de la palabra elote. ¿Qué pasó? Yo, yo no soy de aquí y yo, yo no caí de, antes de, de elote, hay maíz, y, y, etc. Ya está. I can do that in English. <laughs> el lote lo quiere con mantequilla y quesito y un poquito de picantito. Claro, el elote. Eh, well, we spoke, uh, there's the, the word maíces a lot <clears throat> in the documentary. And you're right, eh, it's the lote and it was um, probably, I don't know if there's a part where that's mentioned sí, en Chinanteco. Right, so it's not just elote. Que se está intercambiando. Y la nixtamalización, exacto. But now that you mentioned el elote or the 
the ear of the corn. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing corn, that I did. Corn, corn, cob and corn ear, no? And there's a lot of. A lot, corn, cob or corn ear. But I just want to point out this that I notice is that from the same plant, there's no two elotes alike. Each one is like a family. Every child is different in the same, on the same plant. And that's the, the, the thing that we have with GMOs. They're all exactly the same. And the yellow corn that is soft, that was nooked in the tutties, they're always about the aesthetics that everything, everything looks exactly the same. If you notice each corn and those images, it's totally distinct than the next one. There's no two exactly alike. Well, I want to thank Anissa and the staff here for such a wonderful projection, for inviting us, for having us here, for having this opportunity to have a conversation with our immediate community. And I'm very thankful for putting this together. We are, we are the ones that are very grateful. So just a few things that came up for us as a library. Three of our locations do have seed banks, Portola, Potrero, Bayview. And if you live here, you know there's a farmer's market in almost every neighborhood, including Heart of the City, my favorite, every Wednesday and Sunday right outside these doors. It's gorgeous. And Bayview now has its own farmer's market as well, Dragon Spunk. So thank you all, Yira, Jonathan, for being like all the way out here from Oaxaca. I mean, huge love. They didn't get any money for this. So, and any, the small monorarium they did get goes right back to their work. Gustavo, thank you so much for this film. Daniela, thank you for your local work and being here today. And you, thank you for being here. Have a wonderful day. Come to the farmer's market tomorrow.